friends welcome to anara samay today show is a two part series done by suresh edigar uh, this is the second of the two parts in the first part he spoke to dr joan mancher chairman and managing director at the ngo called the second chance in this second part suresh will talk to dr franklin c southworth a linguistic professor at the university of pennsylvania friends welcome to nri samay today's show is a two part series done by suresh ediga this is the first of the two parts in this suresh will talk to dr john mancher at uh, uh, chair and uh, managing director at the ngo called the second chance in the second part he will talk to dr franklin c southworth is a linguistic professor at the university of pennsylvania Good morning, good evening to all our listeners from NRI Samay. Uh, very warm welcome to everyone. Um, today we have uh, a very distinguished uh, guest. It's an honor to uh, uh, have her on our show. Uh, Joanne P. Muncher is a retired professor of uh, anthropology from the uh, City University of New York. And uh, she's also uh, a chair of an NGO called the Second Chance Foundation. uh which uh, supports the uh, grassroots level organizations in India and also the United States primarily focusing on the issues concerning the uh, poor small and uh, marginal farmers and she's also extensively worked on the issues uh, uh, of of caste land reforms agricultural women related issues for more than i, I believe four decades now so more than half a century more than half a century uh so that that is indeed incredible and and uh, and she has done most of her work in in the southern part of india uh so it it's great to have uh, joan on on our show uh, welcome to anar sama thank you so so joan it, it's not like you were born in india were you no i wasn't but i was oh interested in india from childhood okay and and how did that begin You know, I can't really tell you how it began, but okay. I do know that by the time I was in the 7th grade, I we all had to choose a topic to talk about, and my topic was India's independence. Wow. And this was which year? I'm trying to figure I have to figure a little <laughs> bit figuring with that one to figure out what year that was. Okay. But, uh Six. 19 uh 6 so so it would be 19 it was during the war, I know that much okay uh, you know it was after 42 so just around 43 i guess of so 42 43 around that time wow okay so you were given a topic and then you chose india i, I wasn't given it i chose it okay Yeah, I mean you were asked to pick up a topic and you happened to pick the Indian independence struggle. I didn't happen to because I was interested in India all along. I, I should see. also say that, you know, I was aware of a lot of things that many young people my age were not. Mm. Um to begin with, as soon as the war started, mm. uh my uncle who was a doctor in, in the Air Force was posted to Calcutta. I and see. I still remember things that he wrote in the letters about how the British used whips to whip little children in the streets of Calcutta and that kind of thing. And I've never forgotten all of that. I see. So is that you know, is that is that fair and to I say? And I was very that? young. I I was what? I was uh 12. I see. So is way back. I see. So is, is is it fair to say that it was your uncle's letter that drew your attention? No, that to... wasn't the only thing. I mean, there were all kinds of different things. Mm. My mother got the National Geographic. I read things about Asia. I see. It was all sorts of different little things. I see. I see. So what? So it started at a very young age for you. But what kept you going, though? Like, how did that interest uh, persist with well, you? Well, uh, well, when I went in. I mean I, in college I took courses on uh, that included Indian philosophy, Buddhism, Hinduism, all that kind of thing. And then later on when I went to graduate school, 
I actually decided I'm not very good at it, and I don't remember much of it. But I decided to use Hindi instead of one of the European languages as my se- as my second language for uh, the language exams for my graduate uh-huh. school. I see. So, and I was interested in India earlier on, but there was no funding at that time. So I worked in New York City in a slum in New York City for my PhD thesis. Mm. And while I was finishing my thesis, I applied for a Fulbright to go to India, as well as for an American University of University Women, American Association of University Women's grant to go to India, and that's to, and to work in Kerala. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was so. When was the first time you you been to Kerala or India, for that matter? I went for, I first went to India in 1958. 1958. Uh, and. And, and I actually was, had the opportunity to meet Nehru because they took all the Fulbright people to meet Nehru. Ah, I see, I see. So how was that experience? Do you do you remember? Very uh, interesting. I remember. I don't remember much about meeting him, but I do remember about the experience itself hmm. because I met all sorts of very fascinating people, uh, including people who were in Parliament at that time. I see. Uh, which is one of the which is the first which is one of the first Parliaments. Mm-hmm. Right, that's true. I think it was a second parliament. All right. So, so you went to um, which part of the country did you go to? Was, uh, you said Kerala. Was well, that I first well, I first arrived in Delhi, and I had to go to an orientation, et cetera, et cetera. And then I went down to Chennai, and I had to wait in Chennai for a shipment of my things that were coming because I was going to stay in India for almost two years. Uh, I see. And so I had sent things by sea. Because in those days you couldn't take much by air, mm. and um, and not, not, a lot of things were not available, and so I. But I've lived in. I, I, I was so I was in Chennai for quite a while, and then I went to Kerala, mm. and I worked in, in in the northern part of Kerala in the old Malabar district, which okay. had been part of the Madras presidency. Mm-hmm. And then you just uh, so that was. Two years, and then you came back, or you decided to stay then a little longer. Then I came longer? back. Then I came back, and two years later, I went back again to India. Mm-hmm. Was it again and to I Kerala? Out, or? I, I mean, I ran. Well, the fir- I went first to Kerala, then I went to Tamil Nadu. And that's uh-huh. when I first lived in a Tamil village. I and see. then I did a short stint in West Bengal, also. I see. I see. I was looking at some of the main rice regions of India at the, at that time. I see. Now, what were these visits about? Like, were you pursuing your higher studies? Were you just interested? No, so I had my PhD already. Right. But so, I was, uh, but there was, re- it was, I was pursuing research interests. Mm-hmm. And when I first went to Kerala, I was supposed to be doing a study that was sort of a continuation of my thesis, which was, a, which was looking at child life, at child rearing and family life. But I actually was looking, but I actually paid much more attention to what was going on socially and politically and economically than mm. I did to uh, child rearing, though I did a lot of testing and other things, which I never published much on. I see. Um, but uh, at that time, I was there during the time when the first uh, uh, CPI government was elected mm-hmm. and the protests against it and I was there through that whole thing and I even saw all the kind of unpleasant things that went on to get rid of it etc happened yeah, I so I was there during that whole period then when I switched but then when I decided to go to Tamil Nadu, part of the reason for going to Tamil Nadu was because I wanted to see a more typical part of India I mean Tamil villages are like the rest of India villages in some ways Whereas Kerala is really different because everything was at that time, and less so today, uh, very spread out. Uh, every, no house was right next to every, another house except perhaps along the road, mm-hmm. main road. But otherwise, Kerala was a very dispersed place, and it was really very, very different than the whole rest of India. And I wanted nice. to see more about what the rest of it was like, so that's why I switched to Tamil Nadu. And my I second see. study was already looking at the effects of ecology. Uh, agri- I mean, it was a study of agriculture and social structure, comparing Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 
when I, for my second trip to India. Mm-hmm. And that's a stream that I have followed since then, and I've gotten, and that's when I got more involved even with the small farmers. I see, I see. So it's and interesting. Pro- go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, I was going to just make an observation there. Like you, you felt back in you know 1960s that Kerala was already different to the rest of the states. Uh, was Kerala always like if you compare Kerala with other states in India? You know, Kerala is the most educated state. The percentage of the uh, the literacy rate is really really high. Was that the case back in the 1960s as well, which is why Kerala was also different to the other states? Uh, it was that was true, but it, but it was even earlier, much earlier. Even in pre-British times, it was very different than the rest of the country. First of all, ecologically, it's very different. It mm. looks much more like Sri Lanka or a tropical island than it does like the rest of India. Mm-hmm. Uh, secondly. Uh, it's, it had a dispersed settlement pattern. That is, you didn't have clustered villages anywhere. Mm. Uh, the, the main uh, center was the Naya Taravad and then other people who worked for them. But uh, residences were spread out, uh, usually on the, on, on the, towards the hills, uh, so that the, all of the flat land was used for paddy. And it was really very, very different, even way back. It also had a matrilineal system of inheritance among certain communities. And that got, that's got a very old history. It goes way back. Okay. There are controversies about how far it goes back, but certainly it was there by the 8th century A.D. Mm-hmm. So, that, so it, it, this is not nothing to do with European times or, or, or colonial times. It really goes way, way back. So it's really mm. very different. Right. And as far as the question of education, it was very interesting. In the higher caste, at least, uh, there were girls were educated, to, at least to read, way back, mm. before the British came. Oh, wow. So that has nothing... Then, of course, when... When the Western, when the missionaries came in in the southern half of Kerala with their mission, with their schools teaching using English, then in the northern half, all these people were interested in uh, began to, all these higher castes at least began to get involved in becoming lawyers, doctors, that kind of thing. They educated their daughters also. Mm. So you had real transformation very early on. I mean, it's gotten became more so after you know, after 1960. But even in the late 50s, when I first went there, there was a much higher level of education in Kerala than anywhere else in India that I know of. I see. I see. So, do, do you feel the Kerala that you see now and the Kerala that that back in 1960s? Do you see the, the, if, uh, if the development has been uh, kept according to the changing times? or uh, well, be- yes and no, because I think that there was an idealism among mm. the independence fighters that I met when I was there in 58, 60, even in the, early, even in the early, very early 60s, that is not there anymore. People, people were much less concerned about just their own family wealth and this and that and buying and having and buying and having and much more interested in doing something for the poor. Mm. And there was much more of a concern about low-caste people, untouchables, et cetera, and even issues of untouchability in those days. Mm. And I think that was quite striking. And it was there regardless of political party. I see. I those see. who was, were in the on the left, but even those who were not on the left, had that commitment mm. because they had been involved in the independence struggle. Right, right. I mean, there are people. I'm, well, I met a lot of people who had been in jail mm. before independence. Right, right. And they had a very different attitude about it. I see. Friends, NRSMA is a non-profit independent alternate media from Los Angeles, USA which brings positive stories from grassroots activists from all corners of India and across the world. If you have any interesting episode you would like NRI Samai to cover, we will be happy to do so. NRI Samai would also like to encourage amateur journalists 
who have a flair for highlighting current events. You can be part of our citizen journalist team. You could cover an important event, interview victims of an atrocity, or document an inspirational story. The idea is to have a mix of experience throughout all parts of the world, preferably supported by an audio or a video clip of your story to be aired, which will be the curtain raiser. You can also submit your opinion articles on important topics to NRSMA. We will be happy to put it on nrsmi.com in the opinion section. All your work will be credited only to you. And if you're interested, please send an email to nrsmi at gmail.com. So what has been your uh, experience in, in the sense that, I mean, you have written extensively on, on the cast and uh, uh, the women issues and uh, other farming related issues, which we can get into in, in a little bit. But I want to talk about the, the issues around the caste and, and the women especially. Um, I mean, I, I, and, and I believe you have been frequently visiting India since, since 1958 when you made the first trip. Uh, correct. So have you, have you seen any transformation or any change in terms of the social uh, structure, in, in terms of accepting the lower caste, or it, it, the situation has even gotten worse? Well, What's some things have gotten worse and some things have gotten better. I mean, for many people, who, I saw really a change for it's for some kids to some extent. But I also see today significant inequality between certainly the untouchables and everybody else. Mm. And I've seen it both in terms of income and in terms of their way of life, and even in terms of government policies, indirect, very subtle. Mm. It's really quite striking. I mean, I work with NGOs that are working with some of the poorest, and I really see what is not being done. Mm. And how they even have to fight governments. And both, I mean, I know best Carolyn Tamilnod, uh, especially Tom and Lodge, who I've done a lot of work on that kind of issue. And it's really quite striking, some of the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember any specific incidents or any specific, uh, you know, um, things from the past where you, you were like, you know, in utter disbelief that these kind of things were happening uh, not only back in 1960s, but as recent as, you know, in 2000? Well, I certainly see a failure in some areas where you don't have the, the power of rich, higher caste landlords to get government programs. For example, even the government program of SRI, SCI, which is what I work on a lot, Mm. You know, this is a system of rice intensification and other kinds of crop intensification. It's, it's, I mean, they've taken the river, the excuses, are, those are the river valleys, but they've left out the Palau River and other rivers like that. Um, they have not done very much at all, even where there's very good uh, um, well water to be used to do this and where you can really regulate whether it goes into the fields or not but where the land is owned more by low caste or untouchables mm. and they're not doing anything for example in, the, in all but the riverine parts of South Arcot, the rest of South Arcot is ignored most of Chingaput is ignored, North Arcot is, not, is left out completely for those programs mm. I understand their rationales, but I also think that there is some caste bias, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the failure to help to develop schools. And, I mean, the schools are there, but they need extra things to make them really help these kids. Right. And more is needed, definitely. Mm. Right. And from what I've, the little bit I've seen in Andhra, it's the same kind of thing. That's where true. much more is going to the uh, middle or higher caste than it is to the untouchables. Mm. And it continues. Right, right. And what about the women's issues? Uh, as far as women's issues, they're on and off. But certainly, I mean, I've, I've, you know, 
in very recent times, I've been probably much more influenced by some of the writing that's been translated into English by Women Untouchables, both from Tamil Nadu and Andhra. And there's been quite a bit of it translated into English, which I managed to read and get mm-hmm. hold of. It's quite striking about the extent of inequality, shall we say. Right. There. right. The attitudes, etc. I mean, if something happens to a high caste woman, it's a big to do. If it mm-hmm. happens to an untouchable woman, oh well. That's them. Right. That's the so- so was it was it just because the women were from lower caste that there was inequality, or did you find women in general were facing the inequality uh, uh, issues? Yeah, well, there there was there was much more protest against it actually from some of the people at the bottom because they knew what they would they knew they were supposed to be treated as equal. They felt they should be, mm. and they would express it to me and my assistants. Quite freely. I see. Whereas higher caste women somehow are much more likely to listen to their husbands, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's quite striking. Even among the left in Canada, during, dur- I still remember it during the emergency, you know, talking to some, there was a CPIM meeting in Palgot, and I was talking to the wives, uh, wife and one or two others of uh, the leaders. Mm-hmm. outside the room where they were having their private meeting. And they were saying, oh, I have to go home, I have to fix meals for all the people who are coming, et cetera, et cetera. But they weren't involved in the politics. And there were two or three uh, low-caste, untouchable women sitting there, and they said, we don't do that. We go out and, and agitate and get other women to join us. <laughs> I see. And they answered them back, and it was quite striking. Yeah, they saw yeah. themselves as joining the agitation, whereas the other ones saw themselves as being good wives. Right, right. I and see. That that's was interesting. Really, that was very striking. Right, right. Do you do you see that kind of uh, uh, you know that that kind of um, uh, what do you call the uh, motivation factor among the women from the lower caste even more now because more women are coming out there expressing themselves in, in, in different ways and forms. Do you feel I that? See it that though, but also among the higher caste, because you do have many more educa- educated women, and, the edu- and many of the educated women are very freely expressing what they think. Mm, right. So you, see, you do see that transformation happening now. I see that more so, yeah, because especially not all, not all. Right. But the ones who really have careers, who really have other kinds of things that they want to accomplish in life, hmm. they are really beginning to speak up much more. Right, right, right. Now, off late, you have also been very extensively working on the farming issues. Um, so could, yeah. you, could you share what kind of work uh, you've been doing and what well, was your main well, focus? I mean, I've, what I've been looking at mostly has been this question of the system of rights intensification, a system of crop intensification, and mm. all of its advantages and the tremendous yields they are getting using this method, et cetera, compared mm. to the Green Revolution. And I've also briefly, and I'm trying to get more, I'm going to get get some more information when I get go to India next uh, on how, in a sense. When I was there in the early, late 60s, early 70s, was a period when India could have, may have even been in a position in Tamil Nadu to have begun to do SRI then. But the mm. Green Revolution came in and everything was pushed out. I see. And I don't know if you have seen it or not, but I have some quote, very good quotes from 1962 Government Census Handbook, District Handbooks, mm-hmm. uh, about what they were doing in agriculture at that time, and it's very close to SRI. I see. It's really quite interesting. Uh, and But you see, the United States was pushing very hard, and I'm trying, I'm a, trying to write, a, and I will be writing in great detail about that in this book that I'm working on uh, called Greed or Human Survival, mm. where I look at what is happening 
in Indian agriculture and how it's uh, been, been pushed and distorted by the United States. With, and everyone thinks the Americans are so wonderful. There was an interesting article I read recently. I try to remember the name of the journal that it was in. But mm. it pointed out that in India there's more admiration of... Uh, of uh, the United States and anywhere else in the developing world. And so Indians in America don't really know the extent to which uh, U.S. has had a negative impact on Indian agriculture in a very negative, in a very important way. And that's one of the things that I'm writing about in great detail. Uh, because, and I'm also looking at how much the SRI approach is leading to tremendous increases in yields, not only in rice, but in wheat and lentils and all sorts of other crops, sugar, mm. cane, et cetera, uh, without any artificial inputs or anything else like that. And, of course, those who are supporting GMOs don't like the idea because, obviously, there's not enough pres- profit for the American corporations. Mm. but uh, they're really doing very well in terms of yields. Right, right. Now, you said that uh, back in 1960s, Tamil Nadu, you did see the SRI technique being adopted, um, and then we had this uh, Green Revolution and, you know, uh, starting... And that was completely dropped. It was completely dropped, what they were doing. And it was interesting because it was young men, at that time it was only men, Mm-hmm. doing field research who had studied agriculture at the uh, Agricultural University in Coimbatore, mm-hmm. and who, they were doing the research on this on this kind of thing, and they were collecting data, et cetera. No, I see. Uh, it was really very interesting. No, I see. And one of the things that I found when I was doing research there in the early 70s was that every one of the... Um, agricultural officers who was really open to listening to the village uh, farmers or to other people got transferred. Mm. I mean, they would listen. There were no people. They would accept. Suddenly, they, even sometimes they were promoted, but they were promoted in such a way where they couldn't influence policy. Right. Because they did good jobs, they couldn't be fired or anything like that. But you can so, always promote something to somebody to a position where they can't be very effective. Hmm. So either they, get was, either they get transferred, either they get transferred or right, right. Transferred or promoted to a position where they didn't make any kind of policy decisions. Right. And that was very striking. Right, right. So I think back in uh, once the Green Revolution effects were being seen in, on the Indian agriculture, that was probably late nineties. And uh, did you see... No, no, that was earlier. Even... That was even earlier. By the, by the 80s, the Green Revolution technology was t- had fully t- taken over, at least in Tamil Nadu. Right. I, I mean, see. maybe it was later in some of the other areas, but in Tamil Nadu it was pretty strong mm. by the 80s. Right, right. So now, now do you see, uh, given that everyone has experiences... Do you see uh, people adopting to the natural farming, organic farming now, or there's still a lot of reluctance? I think some are doing it and some are not. Mm -hmm. Some are being helped to do it, some are not. I Mm -hmm. see that there are really, it's very complex. Mm -hmm. It's not something I could just simply off the top of my head answer, but it's certainly clear that there are many people interested in, and this SRI, SCI kind of agriculture. Mm. It has many advantages, apart from the fact that it doesn't require heavy financial inputs on the part of the small farmers, or even medium ones. Mm. It has one other thing, and that is the fact that it offers them a lot of flexibility. So that, for example, in 2000... I'm forgetting whether it was 2012 or 13, uh, when the monsoon was not quite as good for the second season, they were easily able to switch from rice to lentils. I see. And use the exact same techniques and the exact same land. And that mm. was fine. And so they got very, very good uh, 
uh, yields with, the, you know, dolls and grams and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's a yeah. very flexible technology. It's not a technology. Mm. It's a management approach. Right, right. And it, it very, how it's used depends very, very much on where you are, your exact kind of soil, the exact availability of water, how much control you have when, all sorts of things like that. Mm. And, each, and it, it also does one other thing, I, which I think is very interesting. It encourages far, farmer innovation. And I think it's very exciting to see, see farmers innovating. Because they have a sense of autonomy, a sense of satisfaction. They're not just being told what to do. They can also think. Mm. They're using their brains. They're not just being told. Right, right. And that really, I think, is very important. Right. So you think that the Indian agriculture can, uh, or let me rephrase my question. So based on what you have seen in, you know, more than half a century, uh, if there was anything that the, in terms of changing the farming behavior, what would that be that you think would help the farming situation uh, that you see today? I think one of all is offering decent prices for their yield, mm. for, for, their, for what they grow. Mm-hmm. And for emphasizing growing first and foremost for storage and for local communities. And by communities, I mean, let's say you're, in the, you're near to Tanjavoro, you're near to Tam, Chennai or someplace like that, growing for local cities too, but not emphasizing export at the price of local people. Mm-hmm. And ha- and I think I think that this new bill that has been passed to give food to people, it sh- I think it should be increased and made even more so. I think they should be. It should include other things besides a, a grain. It should include the source of protein such as dolls and that kind of thing. And it should be expanded rather than contracted. Mm. I think farmers need to be treated well and to have decent decent markets. So right. that's one of the things that I believe in very strongly. Mm. Another thing is just is more and more stimulation for their imaginations, for their creativity. What can you do? How can you process it? Can you process it in your village? What else can be done here? How can people get together and do something? Mm. How can even poorer farmers work with the middle rung farmers to to create things? Mm. Why aren't you making puffed rice in villages? Why aren't you making rice products in villages? Mm-hmm. I mean, there are so many things that can be encouraged. But right. you need to have, and, and it needs much, much more encouragement because that's the only way they will have a, see that they're making a good living. They're not mm. just surviving. Right, right. That's true. You know, and they need to be respected. and You know, Today in the United States, there is a growing number of young people who are going back into agriculture, and they're going back growing organic vegetables, growing this, growing that. They're doing all kinds of things. In some cases, in the case of India, you could have five or six or maybe even ten farmers together growing things, working together for a co-op that then sells to uh, the local people who who are not in that doing agriculture or doing business or whatever. Mm. But you need to have people working on these kind of things. I see. The potentials are enormous. But you know, the U.S. doesn't want it. The U.S. would like nothing better than to be able to export its very well-subsidized rice and other things to India, whereas mm. India is told it can't use subsidies. Mm, right. Which is just outrageous. Right, right. So in a way, U.S. is uh, having a huge or negative impact on on the uh, uh, agricultural and the farming situation in India. And uh, it has been having a stronghold uh, since, what, 1970, 18? Well, it's been, having a, it's been going on for a long time, but this is something new. This is using the WTO. And the right. thing that's interesting about the WTO, the WTO came out of this earlier thing that was formed in, the, in 1948. I'm forgetting the initials now. 
but in it, the U.S. and some of the European countries were allowed to have subsidies because they already had them. Mm. And that was kept in, in this other organization, and then it was kept when the WTO was formed. So that's allowed by the WTO. But if any other country, any third world country, any developing country wants to have the same kind of subsidy, oh, no, no, because it's not there in their rules. Mm. But the U.S. can. So they would like nothing better than to send their subsidized rice to India and make a lot of money right, and get right. rid of it and kill off all the poor small farmers in India. Mm. Take, get them all out of agriculture and there's no place else for them to go, so it's really get, in the long run killing them off. Right, right. So are, are you also working on the U.S. Uh, side of this uh, issue? or Not, you're working? Only indirectly, only indirectly, no. I, I mean, see. I don't work, I mean, there's a limit to what, what any one person can do. Right, right. But, and I'm really only working on Indian agriculture. I know much more about it, but I have friends and colleagues and other people I talk to. Hmm. Young man who one of the who, one of the young men who's who's working on my blog. Hmm. Uh, he plans to work in the United States, and he's working uh, among the uh, some of these uh, Hispanic laborers, etc. So I learn from other people, but I don't work on the United States. I don't. I can't learn do everything. Right, 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 right. Wonderful. I mean, there's and just a limit to what I can learn and work on and do. Right, I right. I think these are very important issues. Right. Well, Joanne, um, it was a pleasure talking to you. It's, uh, you know, I wish I could uh, continue the conversation. Uh, but uh, we'll talk Manoa, again some other time. But definitely, anyhow, definitely. I'm and gonna, uh, I'm going to put Frank on then and let him talk to you about it. You know, he writes protest songs, so he's going to talk to you about that first. Sure, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Hold on, no, I'm going to go get him. I'm here. You're here. Okay, why don't you start talking then? <laughs> Hi, Frank. <laughs> Hi, friends. Welcome to Anara Summit. Today's show is a two-part series done by Suresh Edgar. Uh, this is the second of the two parts. In the first part, he spoke to Dr. Joan Muncher, Chairman and Managing Director at the NGO called The Second Chance. In this second part, Suresh will talk to Dr. Franklin C. Southworth, uh, Linguistic Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> 